So, welcome back to Faith and Wellness, and together we continue with this beautiful book, After Consecration, The Lens of Mercy. Thank you to those of you that have subscribed and are sharing. So this video will talk about your conscience, my conscience, and the freedom we have. So you made your consecration to divine mercy, your offering to merciful love. Now what? Of course, you're going to want to continue to live the little way by doing the three things we learn about on day 11. Keep recognizing the darkness of your littleness and brokenness. Keep trying to grow in holiness and do little things with great love. Keep trusting and believing that God will satisfy your desires of holiness. But there is something else you'll want to learn to see through the lens of mercy. Let me begin to explain this by saying something about a seemingly unrelated topic, conscience. Conscience, one of the great gifts of the Second Vatican Council is the emphasis it gave to conscience, the voice of God. They speak to our hearts about loving, doing good, and avoiding evil. Now, unfortunately, since the council, there has been a lot of confusion about this topic. For instance, while it's true that we should always follow our conscience, sometimes that's all people ever, ever hear or hear about it. But there's more to the story. Yes, it's true that we should always follow our conscience, but we also have a responsibility to form our conscience properly. In other words, what we think is right and wrong may not actually be what's truly right and wrong. In fact, if most of our moral education comes from Hollywood and CNN and um, some other places like TikTok, YouTube, um, all those places in social media, and not from sacred scripture and church teaching, then we, we have not formed our conscience properly. And what our conscience tells us will likely be wrong. Now, yes, we would still be obligated to follow our conscience under such circumstances. However, we also be guilty of doing wrong because we hadn't taken the time and made the effort to form our conscience properly. So in a sense, the foundation of the entire moral life comes down to properly forming our conscience. All right, so how do we properly form our conscience? Again, we should do it from a scripture and church teaching. Not if that sounds like I'm saying we need to roll up our sleeves and begin studying the Bible and the catechism of the Catholic Church. I am or we at least need to be properly taught from them. But that's actually where things start to get interesting. The freedom of conscience. Did you know that the church gives us a lot of freedom regarding how we properly form our conscience? Now, of course, it doesn't give us freedom to choose when it comes to, do, to something like the Ten Commandments. And those have been proven by time that they work. There, we need to accept those 10 without exception. Still, we do have a lot of freedom regarding how we approach the truth of moral life, which things will emphasize and which truth will especially choose to live by. We see the, this kind of freedom, for example, in the saints, particularly in those who give to the church with major spiritualities. Take St. Francis of Assisi, of course, while he certainly embraced all the truths of scripture and church teachings, he chose to emphasize poverty. That was the lens through which he saw Christ, and so he became poor himself, and poverty colored his walk with Christ. Francis' choice of poverty affected the way his conscience judged him. In other words, because the idea, ideal of poverty held such a high place in Francis' conscience, his conscience would convict him of sin regarding things that probably wouldn't convict us. For instance, Francis would have certainly felt it sinful for him to accept the family inheritance of a mansion. After all, such a luxury would have gone 
against the ideal of following the poor Christ who had nowhere to lay his head. Of course, for others, accepting such an inheritance would not necessarily, necessarily be simple. So we do have a lot of freedom regarding the way we choose to follow Christ and which truths of the gospel will, will loom largest in our heart and conscience. In fact, this freedom of choice is part of the beautiful diversity of Christian life, and it's something the centuries very much appreciated. For instance, we read, we read the following in the introduction to her autobiography. Jesus set before me the book of nature. I understood how all the flowers he has created are beautiful, how the splendor of the rose and the whiteness of the lily do not do not take away the perfume of the little violet or the delightful simplicity of the daisy. I understood that if all flowers wanted to be roses, nature would lose her springtime beauty and the fields would no longer be decked out with little wild flowers. And so it is the world of souls, Jesus garden. So the diversity of authentic spiritualities within the church is pleasing to Jesus, but according to St. Therese, there is one path that particularly attracts him, one path, path more than others that allows God to manifest his infinite grandeur. It's the way of mercy, or as Therese would put it, it's the little way of mercy. The way of mercy, in the same introduction to her autobiography, from which we just read. St. Therese describes the way of mercy in relation to other paths. I understood too that our Lord's love is revealed as perfectly in the most simple soul who resists his grace in nothing as in the most excellent soul. In fact, since the nature of love is to humble oneself, if all souls resemble those of the holy doctors who illumine the church with the clarity of their teachings, it seems God would not descend so low when coming to their hearts. But he created a child who knows only how to make his feeble cries heard. He has created the poor savage who has nothing but the natural law to guide him. It is to their hearts that God de designs or he lowers himself. There are the wild flowers whose simplicity attracts them. When coming down in this way, God manifests his infinite grandeur. Did you catch the revolutionary thinking that's hidden in this passage? It's no less a revolution than the gospel message, that the greatest or the least. See Luke 9, 48. It's the idea that God lowers himself more to give himself to little souls than to the great soul. And so in this way, God manifests his infinite grandeur. In other words, when the Lord stoops down to little souls, he makes his glory shine even more. And that's a big deal. Look, look at it like this. From our perspective, the great souls are well, the great souls. They are the important and accomplished people from God's perspective through the truly great souls or the little souls because they allow God's greatest attribute, his mercy to shine forth most fully. And if we exist simply to glorify God, then it seems that little souls enable God to manifest his glory even more so than other souls. After all, the nature of love is to humble itself. And so the little way is, in a certain sense, the best path for giving God the greatest glory. Ah, uh, but that's not fair for the big souls. Wrong Anyone can become a little soul at heart, just as even the materially rich can be poor in spirit. But simply put the little way, 
simply put a little way, it's a choice. It's a choice that forms our conscience. It's a choice to be little. It's a choice to see ourselves as little. It's a choice to walk the path of a spiritual childhood. St. Therese describes his, this choice in the following paragraphs, which in my opinion is the best description of what it means to be a little soul. To remain little is to recognize our nothingness, to expect everything from God as a child, expect everything from its father it's to be not too distressed by its fault finally it is to be worried about nothing and not to be set on earning our living even even among the poor as long as the child is very little they give him whatever is necessary but as soon as he grows up his father no longer wants to feed him and says work now you can take care of yourself very well it was so as to not hear this that i never wanted to grow up feeling that i was incapable of earning my living the eternal life of heaven i have always reminded little therefore having no other occupation but that of gathering flowers the flowers of love and sacrifice and of offering them to God in order to please him. To be little is also to not attribute to oneself the breaches that one practices, believing oneself capable of anything, but to recognize that God places this treasure of virtue in the hands of his little child to be used when necessary but it remains always God's treasure. Finally, it is not to become discouraged over one's fault, for little children fall often, but they are too little to hurt themselves very much. These words speak for themselves, so I will say no more, especially because we already covered the heart of all this during the retreat, namely the idea of recognizing our littleness. But there is But here is something we didn't cover earlier, something that pushes us forward along the little way, as a way of life, something that also forms our conscience, the choice to see through the lens of mercy. The lens of mercy, just as St. Francis chose to see Christ through the lens of poverty. So St. Therese chose to see him and everything else through the lens of mercy. She describes this reality in a passage we read earlier, a passage that now deserves a sense, a sense, and it deserves, in a sense, a second read. How good is the Lord, his mercy endures forever. It seems to me that if all creatures had received the same graces I received, God would be feared by none, but would be loved to the point of folly. And through love, not through fear, no one would ever consent to cause him any pain. I understood, however, that all souls cannot be the same, that it is necessary there be different types in order to honor each of God's perfections in a particular way. To me, He has granted his infinite mercy, and through it, I contemplate and adore the other divine perfections. All of these perfections appear to be resplendent with love, even his justice, and perhaps, perhaps this even more so than the others seems to me, clothed in love. What a sweet joy it is to think that God is just that he takes into account our weakness, that he is perfectly aware of our fragile nature. What should I fear then? Again, Therese chose to see everything through the lens of mercy. That is the mystery she wanted to glorify, the main mystery that formed her conscience. She chose mercy, and so even God's justice seemed to her clothed in love. But this was not the kind of justice that Sister Febroni thought. Remember Sister Febroni? 
She was the sub prioress in the Lucia convent, who thought Therese was being presumptuous when she taught others to trust boldly in God's mercy so as to avoid the punishment of purgatory. In other words, Febroni was perhaps like the son of thunder in the gospel who wanted punishment and strict justice for sinners. See Luke 9, 54. She was perhaps like some of us who see sins in the church and the world get angry and want fire and brimstone to come down. Well, an exasperated St. Teresa to Sister Febroni and perhaps to us too. My sister, if you look for the justice of God, you will get it. And Sister Febroni got it. According to Therese, she went to purgatory where she was delivered up to the full justice of God, which doesn't sound very comforting. And if you want to go to heaven without going to purgatory, you got to trust in the Lord. And you have to trust in his mercy because if you don't trust in his mercy and you think you can do it all on your own you think that you that God never listens to you because he's punishing you then that's what you're getting but if you truly rely on the Lord trust him with your with all your heart and you call you claim the mercy of God you will get it. So we have a choice, friends. Severe justice or tender mercy. As for me, I choose tender mercy. I don't know about you. Now, I don't know about you, but I chose mercy. I chose to see through the lens of mercy. So what about you? What do you choose before you answer? I should repeat that. We learn on day number 19, namely, the mercy is a double-edged sword. I say that because as the scripture teaches, the measure with which we measure will be measured back to us. See Luke 6.38. So to choose the path of mercy is also to choose to be merciful. After all, only the merciful will be shown mercy. Now remember, blessed are the merciful. So if you want God to be strict with everyone, and if you yourself decide to be strict with others, then God will be strict with you. Again, I don't want, I don't know about you, but I choose mercy and hope to leave mercy. But what about you? What do you choose? I choose mercy. The work of mercy. If you decide to choose mercy, that's great. But now that your decision is going to cost you some work, I mean, Proper conscience formation and learning to see through the lens of mercy doesn't just happen. It takes effort. Okay, so what do you need to do? Well, I have three recommendations. First, read the mercy saints. My first recommendation is to read the book about mercy from whom, from who have chosen the path of mercy, who have done the work of mercy and who saw through the lens of mercy. Now, the first and foremost, in my opinion, would be to read the autobiography of St. Therese of Lusier called A Story of a Soul. And I will be reading that one too. But please don't get distracted by the by sometimes flowery language. It's a masterpiece, especially the latter chapters. Second, I recommend the spiritual journal of St. Faustina, Divine Mercy in My Soul, Diary of St. Maria Faustina Kowalska. Like Therese Faustina also chose to see everything through the lens of mercy. In fact, the two saints are amazingly similar. Their message and in my opinion are the best guides for helping people to see everything through a lens of mercy. They truly are great apostles of mercy for our time. For other recommended titles of mercy, see the resource pages in the in the book. And um, I will be reading all of those. If you have a hard time seeing, don't worry. I'll get to all of them. 
little by little, because remember, my domestic church is my home, my family, and I am a mother of four. And it's not easy, but it is possible with God's mercy. He had an image of divine mercy. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And the image of divine mercy is a thousand words of mercy, knowing that we all have a distorted image of God, uh, of God as a result of the original sin. And you may see, you may listen to the video on day one again if you forgot about it. Jesus wants to heal the distortion by giving us a true image of His mercy for our time. Specifically, He appeared to Saint Faustina and told her to paint the image of himself with the words, Jesus, I trust in you. At the bottom, he promised to give great graces through the image, and it's become a source of healing for tens of millions of people throughout the world. I can think of no better way to begin to see through the lens of mercy than by spending time each day gazing upon this image of Jesus. Now, while Jesus' promise of grace applies to every image of divine mercy, I highly recommend the recently restored Bilinius version. See above the center. That one is so beautiful. Which is the recently restored painted under St. Faustina's careful direction. And you can get the image uh, by calling 1-800-804-3823. Also, if you do get an image of Divine Mercy, you may want to consider enthroning it in your home. And you will um, have the links to those videos. Or actually, just look at the playlist of the 33 Days to Merciful Love and scroll down and it's right there. Become a, uh, a Marian missionary of divine mercy. The Marian missionaries of divine mercy is for people who really want to get into mercy as a spiritual a spirituality. It's basically an organized organization for those who complete a, a thorough a thorough adult faith formation program that goes through all aspects of divine mercy and spirituality. The program is called. Hearts of Fire, parish-based programs from the Mary and Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. And you can learn more about, about it in the resource page. And after helping belonging to the organization as a Marian missionary, involves a minimal commitment of prayer and service. Service and includes opportunities for further formation for myself and our well from from the, the from the fathers of divine mercy and um and you can also visit the divine mercy national shrine in stockbridge massachusetts if you think you might be interested in becoming a marian missionary you can order the free handbook, which is the official uh, book for Marian missionaries and explains everything. And you may learn more about it if you visit marianmissionaries.org or see the resources. Um, and I will, I will be recording all these books too as well. That's my way of contributing. Closing prayer. I hope you'll find these three recommendations helpful to for learning to see through the lens of mercy now i ask you to pray for me my community the marian fathers of the immaculate conception and all the marian missionaries of divine mercy specifically would you pray would you pray for the following will you pray would you pray the following prayer of centuries for us Yes, of course, and we are going to pray it together. Merciful Father, in the name of our lovable Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and all the saints, I ask you to set the Marian fathers and the Marian missionaries of divine mercy on fire 
with your spirit of love and to grant them the grace of making you deeply loved. Thank you for your prayers. I also, and also pray for me as well and my family as I always pray for you. I will also pray this prayer for you and I hope you enjoy your retreat. May your offering to merciful love, your consecration to divine mercy brings you great gifts of happiness, peace, joy. God bless you. And in the uh, following video, I'm going to talk about leaving the offering, how we can console the heart of Jesus and how, how to leave the offering on a daily basis. Okay. And I already have, um, and I already did the family offering, Divine Mercy and Thornman video, which you can follow. So may the Lord bless you and those who you love. And remember, keep all the, pray uh, all the priests um, in your prayers. And also the ones that are in purgatory. Because there are a lot of priests and nuns that are in purgatory waiting. Like, like Sister Febroni that didn't believe in God's mercy. So... We need to pray for them so that they can enjoy the mercy of God and go to heaven. So remember to pray this, Merciful Father, in the name of our lovable Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and all the saints, I ask you to see the Marian fathers and the Marian missionaries of divine mercy on fire with your spirit of love and to grant them the grace of making you deeply loved. May the Lord bless you and those who you love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there will be another video on leaving the office.